buenos días a todos. Egunon, good morning. Eh, tenemos aquí a Drew Godard, el director de Bad Times at the Royal, que clausura la sección oficial de esta edición de, del festival. Y lo clausura, si la habéis visto, por todo lo alto, con una fiesta por todo lo alto. Eh, no sé si tenéis alguna pregunta. Si... Okay. You... Okay. Hola, buenos días. Eh... Buenos días. Yo quería preguntar por, bueno, su anterior película, eh, Cabin in the Boots, era un festín de homenajes al género de terror y llena de referencias. Quería saber qué referencias tiene para, para esta nueva película, qué homenajes puede haber eh, a la hora de, de haberla escrito. Y luego quería preguntar también, respecto a Chris Hesworth, eh, eh, está muy asociado a, a, al mundillo de superhéroes, a ser un, un personaje bueno... Y aquí es, si se me permite la expresión, es un auténtico cabronazo. Entonces, cuando, cuando, cuando le ofreció el papel, ¿cómo se lo tomó? ¿O fue él el que dijo, quiero cambiar totalmente de registro? Gracias. Can you test it? <laughs> so sorry, so sorry. Technical difficulties. Hola, hola otra vez. Que... <laughs> Let's try it again. Decía que su anterior película, The Cabin in the Boots, era todo un festín de... No, nothing. No? Is that working? It's not working. It's in the free? It's on three. Wait a minute. Okay, it's in the free and it should be here. There, the we, there we go. Yeah? There we go. Okay, Very good. good. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> pues... Eh, su anterior película, The Cabin in the Woods, era todo un festín de, de homenajes y de referencias, en ese caso al género de terror. Eh, quería saber si en su nueva película, eh, qué, qué referencias ha tenido en su nueva película y qué tipo de homenajes ha podido incluir a la hora de escribirla. Y quería preguntar también sobre Chris Hemsworth, que está muy asociado a ser un personaje bueno, eh, sobre todo gracias a, a los superhéroes de Marvel. Entonces, cuando le ofreció el personaje que es un auténtico cabronazo, eh, ¿qué pensó sobre eso? O si fue él el que dijo que quería cambiar totalmente el registro. Gracias. Perfecto. Cuando setting out and, and, and exploring uh, the crime fiction that I had loved so much. Uh, authors such as Dashiell Hammett, Agatha Christie, Jim Thompson, James Elroy, all were very much uh, on my mind as I was working on this film. Then as it came time to direct, I started looking at uh, uh, directors who, I, who inspired me and then continue to inspire me every day. Uh, certainly the works of John Huston, Sergio Leone, um, Alfred Hitchcock's very present there as well. Uh, and it all sort of went into this, into, into this pot and became an influences for Bad Times at the El Royale. And it started with a very simple concept. Uh, one stormy night in 1969, a bunch of mysterious characters all check into a hotel and we, and we see them uh, start trying to kill each other very quickly. And it was very much the stuff that drama is made of. And, and so when it came time to populating this, I just looked at uh, my favorite actors on the planet. Uh, uh, it was very much a pipe dream. Uh, you, you start with Jeff Bridges, Cynthia Erivo, Dakota Johnson, John Hamm, and yes, the great Chris Hemsworth. Uh, this is now the second film I've done with Chris Hemsworth. I hope to do many more with him. Uh, I love working with him very much. He is, um, one of the things I don't think people know about him is how, how nuanced and complicated and extraordinarily precise he is as a performer. He doesn't get a chance to do that because he's so busy saving the world all the time. And in this particular case, I wanted to show a darker side of him. I wanted to show audiences a side of Chris that they'd never seen before. And Chris, to his credit, was very game. He, I think he saw a chance to do something different and explore new territory. And, uh, and so I'm very excited for the world to see what Chris Hemsworth does in this movie. Thank you. 
Hi there. Hello. Hi. Congratulations. I had so much fun. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, and I have a curiosity. Um, there is a moment in the movie in which we can see in the news that there has been some kind of murder, series of murders, right. and then one of the characters switches the TV off uh, fast. And I don't know if it has anything to do with any of the characters, or it's just a distraction for us to be suspicious of something. Yeah, certainly uh, nothing in the film is arbitrary. Every decision is there for a reason and as it reflects on these seven characters. Now, we are not overt about it. It is, it is not something that we want to, uh, it is intentionally ambiguous, I suppose, but nothing is arbitrary. Uh, I leave it to the audience to decide how it interacts with the film, but if you pay close attention, you can see how, which characters it refers to and what happened in that, in that time. A mí personalmente me interesaba saber eh, cómo fue el proceso de escritura del guión. Por un lado, por este sitio estupendo que, que tengo entendido que es bastante mítico en Estados Unidos, el Royal, y por otro lado, porque en, en, en varias de, de las películas que has escrito, algunas de ellas también dirigido, eh, me da la sensación de que tienes muy en cuenta elementos a priori externos al guión, como por ejemplo el montaje, ¿no? Y en esta ya se ve a nivel de estructura, a nivel del uso de los match cuts, todas estas cosas. Entonces, ¿cómo es para ti el proceso de sentarte a escribir este guión? ¿Sabías que ibas a dirigirlo? Cuando uh, I start working, I start with a very simple adage, and it's that just simply write the film that you want to watch. Uh, I don't worry about anything other than that. I just put myself in the audience and write what I want to see. So in this case, it started with the concept. It started with characters. I picked sort of characters that were uh, archetypes in the noir genre. You have very, very straightforward archetypes. The priest, the singer, the cop, the junkie. These were all in the crime thriller. And then I set out to humanize them, show sides of them that we're not, uh, that we don't always get a chance to explore and see. And so when I write, I start with character. Um, there's a couple big surprises in the movie uh, that I don't want to spoil too much for the audience, but if you've seen it, uh, characters do surprising things. That's because when I was writing scenes, I would get to a place where I wasn't sure what to do, and then I would ask myself, well, what would Darlene do in this situation? What would Darlene do if confronted with this man? and let that dictate where the story goes. It, I, when I follow character as opposed to following plot, it leads me to much more interesting places, and that was how I approached this movie. Okay. Hello, and congratulations for the wonderful film. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's one line in the film that I would like to use it as an excuse to ask a question. <laughs> the Great. memory of a man uh, can be sometimes better and more interesting than uh, the man himself. Does that thing apply also to directors? <laughs> I think it does apply to directors. I mean, as I was working on this movie, clearly there is elements of cinema in the narrative. Uh, the idea of voyeurism is a very cinematic idea. As an audience, we are watching people and watching them when they do not know they're being watched. And the characters within this movie do not know they're being watched. And it puts you in the position of the audience but as a, char and a character in the film. And so this idea that, that we, are, we are more than uh, who we are as people, this idea that as directors or filmmakers or artists, uh, our work supersedes ourselves, it was very much on my mind as we were, as we were making this film. It's much more important to, to worry about what you have to say and hope that it, it uh, touches a universal truth among people. Eh, buenas, hola aquí. Eh, yo quería saber, bueno, todos los personajes de la película están como muy marcados por la violencia, tienen unos trasfondos muy violentos todos, salvo posiblemente el personaje de, de la cantante, de, de ella, y como has dicho que nada es arbitrario en la película, me gustaría saber un poco qué quieres explicar con, con eso. Gracias. Uh, very much for me the movie is about violence and how, how violence echoes through time and how violence echoes um, through people and affects their lives from the outset. Uh, if you look at, at each character, they are, they are victims and perpetrators of violence, and those consequences um, shape the narrative of the movie. Just because, and violence can come in many forms. Darlene may not, we may not show physical violence done to 
Darlene, but we show something much deeper, which is emotional violence. The way violence is inflicted on Darlene uh, is in some ways much more vicious than um, a punch or a kick. Uh, it is done to her, her artistic soul. And, and so when I was constructing the movie, it was very important to me to explore how violence is created and to show violence in a way that was not fetishistic. Um, everything violent that happens in the movie has consequences. Everything violent that happens in the movie echoes. Uh, and, and the movie itself, uh, I think, takes a very firm position on what that violence means. Thank you. Hola. <coughs> Quería preguntarte eh, sobre el, el, un poco el periodo histórico en el que sitúas la peli. La sitúas en 1969, eh, en el que ya había asesinado a Luther King, Charles Manson cantaba por allí, eh, Kennedy eh, también fue asesinado, la guerra de Vietnam, etc. Entonces, eh, digamos que Estados Unidos, la sociedad de Estados Unidos se levantaba del sueño cuando se daba cuenta que era una pesadilla. Y me pregunto si eh, el hecho de escribir esta película justamente ahora es porque encuentras resonancia de, 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 esa, de, ese, de esos malos tiempos, de esos bad times, como dice el título, en la época actual de Estados Unidos. I think part of why I like uh, dealing with a different time period is it allows you to explore issues of our time without being overt about it. And the thing that made the 60s interesting to me is you're dealing with intense political upheaval, intense political turmoil, and at the same time, you had this great awakening of art. You had arguably some of the best pop music in history was being written. Um, I don't think that's an accident. I don't think those two things are are separate. I think times of great turmoil can lead to times of great art, and I think in many ways that's how artists endure great turmoil, is to process this through the art. So in working on the film, it was not an accident that Darlene came to the forefront. Uh, Cynthia Rivo's character is, a, is the artist of the film and is struggling with how to endure the violence of the time around her. Uh, and, and by setting it in the 60s, it allowed me to explore that. Certainly the evils that they were dealing with in the 60s are, are not unique to the 60s. When you start to, to study history, you realize that these evils have been going on a long time, and the evils that we are dealing with now in our world are nothing new. Hi, me again. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was thinking about the, the songs that Darlene sings. They are such an important part of the movie. Um, so how do you choose those songs if you chose them at all? Maybe it was someone else. Yeah, uh, when I wrote the script, I wrote every song choice into the script because the songs, in many ways, the songs are the eighth character of the film. Uh, it, it, the, song, the, the movie is about music. It is about how music... Uh, how music allows at least me to, to endure difficult times. So uh, scenes were written to those specific songs. When we, were, we storyboarded, we blocked them. All of these songs were chosen for a reason. Darlene is a character who does not, she's very armored. Uh, she does not show her emotions. The only time her emotions comes out are through song. And so we wanted to see that and, and show the emotional resonance of, of what she was going through. And so when we picked the songs, it was all about what she would go through as a person and allow the emotion to dictate the song choice. Yo, en, re, en relación con, con el personaje de Cynthia, tenía una pregunta, es una curiosidad que yo tengo, eh, perdonadme, pero eh, ¿por qué contratar a Xavier Dolan para un, ese cameo? No, no sé, me ha llamado la atención. O sea, tal vez eres eh, seguidor de sus películas o... Oh. Yes, uh, so he, Xavier is an extraordinary director, an extraordinary actor, and I just wanted to work with him. I mean, one of the fun parts about being a director is you just get to pick your favorite, your favorite people, and then call them and be like, could you please come be in my movie? And they'll take your calls. And so uh, I just wanted to work with Xavier. I think he's such an extraordinary talent, and it was very special for him to come do this film. Okay. Hola, de nuevo. Eh, Yo quería preguntar sobre, sobre, quería saber si trabaja con storyboards, 
eh, porque no sé, me ha llamado mucho la atención respecto al interior del hotel del Royal eh, las simetrías o casi simetrías eh, en los planos que había, en muchos planos, los colores también en algunos momentos, eh, bueno, en muchos, y no sé, me ha hecho pensar que, que todo eso estaba dibujado previamente con storyboards o similares. Gracias. Yeah. Yeah, storyboarding is a very key part of my process. Uh, I like to work out every shot of the movie uh, in conjunction with my cinematographer, Seamus McGarvey, who is a luminous talent. Um, we work very hard on our shots and our designs. We had to design the hotel itself around the camera shots. We, you know, so much of what we did uh, dictated, was dictated by the shots. And so we would uh, plan those months and months and months in advance. There's one shot in particular where we're moving down the corridor with John Hamm. Uh, that shot took eight months to figure out because we don't cut and you see inside every room and all of that was done almost as a ballet because Cynthia Erivo is singing live the entire time and we had to figure out how to do that. Uh, and it took a lot of research and development. It was a very difficult shot to achieve, uh, but luckily we had an extraordinary team that was game and, and figured out. It was very satisfying when we got that shot finally. Buenos días. Buenos días. Quería preguntarle como director, como productor, como guionista, ¿ha cambiado algo en la industria del cine a raíz del movimiento Me Too? Y también, más concreto, ¿ha cambiado algo en la forma, por ejemplo, de negociar un desnudo? Gracias. Um, I think change is very much, yes, I think to answer your question, change is here. And change does not necessarily happen fast, but it, um, but it happens slow, it happens with, with moments, it happens with empathy and awareness. And it was something we were all very conscious of in this movie. Um, we tried very hard to create an environment free of discrimination and harassment. And, um, and, and we took very seriously, I took as a filmmaker very seriously, the message of the movie, because in many ways what the movie is saying is, is as important to how we say it. And, and so at its core, this movie is a very angry movie, and it is very, mu very much dealing with the issues of our time uh, on screen. ¿Alguna pregunta? Yo tenía otra, eh, aunque no quiero escucharme tanto, pero bueno, aprovecho. I like eh, hearing you. <ríe> eh, eres, bueno, es un director que empezó su trayectoria, si no me equivoco, como guionista en series de televisión, como Buffy Caza Vampiros, como Perdidos, o sea, es decir, dos grandísimos o de los más grandes ejemplos de, de, de las series eh, fantásticas. ¿no? ¿En aquel entonces ya sabías que querías ser director o fue algo que te encontraste por el camino? It all comes from a place of love and love for cinema. I don't really, I grew up in a small town in the mountains of New Mexico. Um, I did not know I could do this as a job, as a child. I did not know. I just knew I loved movies. I loved writing. I loved, I loved photography. And, and I let that dictate. I, 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 drove, I was very naive. I drove out to Hollywood, uh, slept on my uncle's couch who was not in the business and just took any job they would give me. And I've been very lucky that I get to do what I like, get to do. Um, I love writing, I love directing, I love producing. Uh, I love all of it, I'm, and it, it, keeps, it keeps it fun to do different things every day. Um, the great part about television is that every eight days you're making another hour of material that allowed me to do a whole lot of different jobs. You, you get a lot of experience working on shows like Buffy and Lost because, because those shows were all so ambitious And, and they straddle genres very, very well. And so you know, I, I was very grateful to get to do all of those different things in such a short period of time. Okay, thank you so much. Hola, buenos días. Eh, Hola. Enhorabuena por, por la película, me ha encantado, de verdad. Eh, yo tengo una pregunta que trata sobre los personajes. ¿no? Nadie es quien dice ser al principio y solamente dicen la verdad cuando, cuando se les lleva al límite. Eh, me gustaría saber en, en qué se ha basado para, para poder llegar a ese resultado y si has estudiado psicología, porque están muy bien llevados los, los personajes. Gracias. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. Um, 
No, I, I don't know that I, I studied a lot of psychology, but I do study people. I think my job as a writer is to empathize and, and listen. And that's one of my favorite parts of the job is to try on somebody else's clothes and see where they take me. Certainly with each of them, with each character, I would, I would almost transform myself as I was writing each character and, and try to live in their skin and think about what they were struggling with and what were the things that they, um, that they felt and feared uh, as I was working on them. And it, 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 uh, it led me to some very dark and interesting places. Hola, ¿qué tal? Hola. Eh, yo quería preguntar por el hotel. Eh, tengo entendido que es un hotel real, que existe y que hay todo un mito en torno a lo que fue. Eh, quería preguntar qué, qué se sabe, qué se rumorea, qué ocurrió en ese hotel, ese hotel y quién pasó por ahí. Well, you know, when I when I set out to make the movie, I wanted to make um, my own hotel. There, it, it wasn't based on any one hotel. Certainly there were several hotels that had a lot of urban legends ab about them. Uh, the Calneva in particular was a hotel that was in California and Nevada. And in the 60s there was a lot of um, rumors that, that uh, dark and interesting things were happening there. Um, some of the things that you saw in the film, such as the FBI tampering with the hotel, were rumored to have happened with these hotels in the 60s. Hoover was very um, notorious for bugging hotels and spying on his enemies and using that information to gain political power. Uh, and that was very much on my mind, this idea of surveillance and power and how power accumulates in this time. But there were also several other hotels that were sort of known for their voyeuristic uh, uh, peccadillos. The, uh, I have to say, researching this hotel, you found, I, I stumbled on a lot of dark hotels, and it made me think about hotels in a very different way. Once you study what can happen in hotels, you're, you never fully feel safe anymore. You're always looking at the mirror, going, <laughs> wonder what's back there. Tenemos tiempo para una última pregunta. Sí. Bueno, vamos contigo. Bueno, pues hola de nuevo. Eh... It's good to see you again. Yeah, great. <laughs> Eh, yo quería, eh, si me, si tengo una sensación al acabar de ver la película y es que todos los actores, el equipo, seguramente también, claro, se lo han pasado en grande. Quería que me confirmara o me desconfirmara eso. Y bueno, quizá me llevas toda otra pregunta, que es si hubo algún trozo de la película concreto que le costara más en realizar. Yeah, to answer the first question, we had a wonderful time. I am not. I'm not an artist who believes that you need pain to make art. I actually believe that artists do their best work when they are nurtured and protected and safe. Uh, so I try to create an atmosphere on my sets that protect the artist. I want people to be happy to come to work. I find that people are more willing to, to explore the darker sides of themselves when they feel protected. That's just my personal um, belief in how I approach the job. So certainly, when you get into the third act of this film, um, from a emotional point of view, that was the hardest part of the job because you had actors tied up around a table for long periods of time. And each day, each, a different person would have to explore um, some very complicated emotions. And so while fire is burning all around us, we used real fire because I don't like computer generated fire. I don't like computer generated effects. I don't, I feel like you lose something. But as a result, it made for a very hot uh, and, and difficult set. And, and, the, and it was, we shot around that table for about three weeks. It took about three weeks to do all of that. And so every single day was, we'd be exploring somebody's pain. So Monday we would explore Dakota's pain. Tuesday we'd explore Cynthia's pain. Wednesday we would explore Jeff's pain. Thursday we'd explore Lewis's pain, Monday back to Dakota's pain. It would go around and around, and it was, um, it was a very intense time. It was a very intense shoot, but I'm so grateful that the actors were willing to, to go to these places and explore, explore this side, because I, I believe um, great humanity came out of those performances, and, and it was only because they were willing to go there. It was only because they were willing to dive into the crucible with me 
uh, and each other uh, that we were able to achieve that. Okay. Pues eh, yo le daría un fuerte aplauso por esta gran fiel de fiesta que es esta película. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.